I hope to do two things in this talk. I hope to convince you that free will is an illusion and that there's no way of thinking about it coherently in terms of what we now understand about the nature of reality. The problem is free will is just a non-starter philosophically and scientifically. There's no, unlike many other illusions, there's no way you can describe the universe so as to make sense of this notion of free will. Free will as a concept is, is so incoherent that it can't be mapped onto any conceivable reality. And I hope to persuade you that this truth matters. It actually changes something about the way we view the world. Now, the, the, the popular conception of free will rests on two assumptions. It, the first assumption is that each of us was free to behave differently than we did in the past. If, if you could rewind the movie of your life to some moment 10 minutes ago or 10 hours ago, 10 years ago, you would be able to proceed differently than you did. If you, if you chose A, you could have chosen B. If you became a, a firefighter, you, you could have become a policeman. You had chocolate ice cream, you could have chosen vanilla. It, it certainly seems to most of us, most of the time, this is the universe we're living in. The, the, the second assumption is that each of us is the conscious author of our thoughts and actions. So that, so that the part of you that thinks and perceives and experiences your life in the present moment is the, actually the author of your thoughts and choices and subsequent behavior. Now, the problem, unfortunately, is that we know that both of these assumptions are false. The first problem is that we live in a world of cause and effect, and either our wills are determined by a long chain of prior causes, and we're not responsible for them, or they're determined by some random influences, and we're not responsible for them. And no matter how you, you turn this dial between the iron law of determinism and randomness, this notion of free will doesn't make any more sense. There's, there's, no, there's no way of combining chance and determinism that makes sense of free will. And, and consciousness clearly is not in the driver's seat. For instance, there's, there's now a tradition of doing experiments where you give people a very simple choice just to, to push one button, the left button, or the right button. And they can do, they can, they can push whichever they want, whenever they want. So it's so, uh, and the only other task you give them is to watch a special clock where they can discriminate time very, in a very fine-grained way. And they just have to notice what time it was when they finally consciously made up their mind. What you find, and what, what the, the first person who did this, Benjamin Labette did, a physiologist who, who had people hooked up to EEG while doing this, but it's since been replicated with functional magnetic resonance imaging and even direct recordings from the, from the cortices of, of surgical patients, you find that the time at which a person consciously decides, thinks they have consciously decided to, to push the left button versus the right, come some seconds often, uh, at minimum half a second, sometimes up to five seconds or seven seconds after the brain has already decided. You can tell what the person is going to do before they know what they're going to do by looking at the, the brain data. Now obviously this gap is, is, is fundamentally hostile to the notion of free will because this means that someone could tell what you're going to do at a point in time where you think you're still making up your mind. But, and people have been wrestling with these data for years trying to collapse this interval and some imagine that they have. I'm not persuaded by any of those results. But the truth is, even if you collapsed it totally and the moment your brain decides was in fact the moment that you were consciously aware of deciding, there still wouldn't be room for free will. You still wouldn't know why it is you picked left over right and you, and you wouldn't have created the conditions of your picking. You wouldn't have tuned your brain to that precise state that, that led to that behavior. Now, what does it mean to say that, that someone acted of his own free will? Well, if it means anything, it must mean that he could have done otherwise. He could have behaved differently than he did.
And not based on some random influences over which he had no control, but, but because he, as the conscious subject, was in fact the author of, of his actions. But the problem is there's no one, no one has ever found, found a way of describing how physical processes could occur that would make sense of this claim. So, so you consider your generic murderer. A person's choice to commit a murder is preceded by a certain pattern of electrochemical activity in his brain, which is in turn the product of prior causes, some combination of bad genes and the developmental effects of an unhappy childhood, and then whatever is impinging on his brain in, uh, in that moment. We are downstream of causes of which we're not conscious and, and cannot possibly be conscious. The moment we catch sight of this stream of causes, reaching back into this, this person's childhood and beyond, and, and out into the world beyond their skin, that his culpability seems to disappear. To, to say that he would have done otherwise, or could have done otherwise, had he wanted to, is simply to say he would have been a different person had he been a different person, or he would have lived in a different universe had he lived in a different universe. And, and as disturbing as I might find such a person's behavior, I have to admit that if I traded, if I could trade places with him, Adam for Adam, I would be him. I mean, there's no extra part of me that could decide to see the world differently or, or, or could decide to resist the impulse to victimize other people. And even if you believe that each of us harbors an immortal soul, this, this problem of responsibility remains. I cannot take credit for the fact that I don't have the soul of a psychopath. I didn't make my soul. If I had truly been in this person's posi position, if I had the same genes and the same brain, the same life experience, or the same soul, I would have done exactly as he did and for the same reasons. So, so the role of luck in our lives appears decisive. The problem of free will is actually deeper than the problem of cause and effect. Free will doesn't even correspond to a subjective fact about ourselves. Now, now most people think we have a, a subjective, a, st a strong subjective experience of free will. And the problem is just that we can't map it on to physical reality. This, I think, is an illusion. I think, I, I think we actually do not feel as free as we think we do. This, this relies on us not paying very close attention to what it's like to be us. The, the truth is we feel or presume an authorship over our actions, over certain and thoughts, over a certain channel of information in our conscious minds that is illusory. The endurance of free will as a philosophical problem in need of a solution is born of the fact that, that most of us feel that we freely author our thoughts and intentions and actions, therefore. However difficult it may be to make sense of this in logical or scientific terms. There is actually no evidence of free will in our experience. And if you pay close attention to your experience, you can see this. If you pay attention, you can see that you, you no more author the next thing you think than the next thing I say. Thoughts simply appear in consciousness. Now, what, what, what are you going to think next? What am I going to say next? I could suddenly start talking about why we don't eat owls. Why don't we eat owls? They seem perfectly good. Okay, now, no, the, what, where did that come from? Okay, it, 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 came, it came out of nowhere as far as you're concerned, but the same thing is happening in your own mind at this moment. I mean, you've all made an effort to be here tonight, presumably because you wanted to hear what I had to say about free will, and now you're trying to listen to me, but you also have a voice in your head that says things. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> and it, it, it says things, uh, it, it, it says things that are completely unconstrained at times by the thing you're trying to focus on. I mean, I'm, I'm standing up here trying to reason with you. And you, you will think, he does look a little like Ben Stiller. <laughs> Thoughts just emerge in consciousness. 
We are not authoring them. We, we can't choose them before we think them. That would require that we think them before we think them. If you, if you can't control your next thought and you don't know what it's going to be until it arises, where is your freedom of will? The, the, the contents of consciousness are, are born of an unconscious mental life. You, you can't honestly take credit for your unconscious mental life. You, you have, you're making millions of decisions right now with organs other than your brain, of which you're not conscious of. But you don't feel responsible for these decisions. I mean, are you making red blood cells at this moment? Now, your body is, hopefully. But if it were to stop doing this, you would be the victim of that change. You wouldn't be its author. Our experience in life is actually totally compatible with the truth of determinism. We don't have this robust sense of free will the moment we actually pay attention to how thoughts and intentions arise. And again, it's important to notice that this is true whether or not we have immortal souls. And there's no, the case I'm building against free will does not presuppose philosophical materialism. But even if we have souls that are somehow loosely integrated with the brain, the unconscious operation of a soul grants you no more free will than the unconscious neurophysiology of your brain does. Everything you're consciously aware of in every moment is the result of causes of which you are not aware and over which you exert no conscious control. So, so how can we be free as conscious agents if everything that we consciously intend is caused by things we did not intend and of which we are entirely unaware? We can't. We can't choose what we choose in life. And, and, what we, and when it seems that we choose what we choose, or perhaps when going back and forth between two options, we don't choose to choose what we choose. I mean, that, there is a regress here that, that ends in darkness. Yeah, yes, you are free to do whatever you want, but where do your desires come from? The next choice you make is going to come out of a wilderness of prior causes which you can't see and didn't bring into being. Where is the freedom in doing what one wa wants when one's wants are the product of prior causes which one cannot inspect and therefore could not choose and, and one had absolutely no hand in creating? And, so, and what I'm going to do next remains a mystery that is fully determined by a prior state of the universe from the perspective of your conscious mind, you are actually no more responsible for your next thought than you are for your, your birth into this world. You have not built your mind. And in moments where you seem to build it, where you finally take the reins of your life and, and, you, and you, you decide to acquire knowledge or, or learn a new skill, the only tools at your disposal are those which you've inherited from moments past. No one picks their parents or the, or the society to which they were born. No one picks the moment in history in which they live. No one picks their genes or their, the environmental influences that determine the structure of their brain. No one determines how their nervous system gets shaped from the moment of conception onward. Your physical development is something you had no hand in. You didn't pick any of the influences that's, that shaped your neurophysiology. You didn't pick your soul if you have one. And yet th this totality of influences and states will be the thing that produces your next decision. Just think of the context in which you are going to make your next decision. Your brain is making choices based upon beliefs and intentions and states that have been hammered into it over a lifetime. You, you are no more responsible for the, the exact structure and state of your brain in this moment than you are for your height. What you, what you do based on conscious, predetermined decisions says more about you than anything else. Thoughts simply arise in the mind. But the, the idea that we as conscious beings are deeply responsible for the characters of our minds simply can't be mapped onto reality. And 
if we want to be guided by reality rather than by the fantasy lives of our ancestors, I think we have to revise our view. Thank you very much.